In a virtual memory system, the logical address space of a process can exceed the amount of available memory. This feat is accomplished by storing portions of the process that are not currently being used on disk instead of in memory. The process is still partially resident in memory and can execute as long as the portions of the process that are needed are in memory. Here we see two processes on disk, process A and process B. They are broken up into their pages. A consists of five pages, A0 through A4, and B consists of three pages, B0 through B2. I will now show how portions of these processes can be in memory while the entirety is on disk. Only a portion of memory is shown here, but we can assume for this example that the portions I am showing contain the entirety of the pages from processes A and B that are present in memory. On the left, we see frame numbers. I've started in the middle of memory at frame 10 and go through frame 14. Frame 10 contains page A0, and frame 11 contains page A3. Later, at frame 13, I have page A2. So I have three pages of process A. They are not stored in order, and not all are present. I'm missing A4 and A1. Similarly, with process B, I have two of the three pages, and they are not contiguous. Despite this, it is still possible for code associated with processes A and B to execute. And as long as these processes are currently focused on portions of the code that are present in memory, they can execute without problem. When needed, pages that are on disk but not in memory can be swapped in. However, all of this information needs to be maintained in page tables. Here's what those look like. As with simple paging, each process has its own page table. The page table for process A indicates which frame in memory contains each page of the process. However, Unlike simple paging, virtual memory paging allows for certain pages to be absent. So this table indicates that page 0 of process A is located at frame 10 of memory. And sure enough, if we look at frame 10, we see that page A0 is there. There is a bit in the page table, P for present, that indicates that this designated page is in fact present in memory at this time. Pages two and three of process A are also present and have their present bits marked. Pages one and four are not in memory and therefore the present bit is not set. It is therefore irrelevant what frame is being referred to. For each process, there is also a bit M for modified. This indicates whether or not the page contents have changed since being copied into memory. Now recall that there are different types of portions of a process. There's the executable code and the data and the stack. The code itself will not change during execution. So that portion of the process will never be modified. However, some portions of the process, like the data, are very likely to change. During the execution of a process, it may be copied back and forth between disk and memory several times. Therefore, if a page is modified in memory, and needs to be copied back to disk, we have to make sure that all changes to that page in memory are also copied back to the disk. In contrast, 
if the page was not modified in memory, then whenever we are finished using it in memory, we do not have to copy it back to disk, since an original clean copy of the page is already present on the disk. Let's see what happens when these two processes run for a while and interact with each other. Let's say that page A0 contains some portion of the data for process A. A is currently executing, and so some portion of memory here gets modified. Because page A0 has been modified in memory, we mark the modified bit in the page table. As execution goes on, we will eventually give up the processor, allowing another process to execute. Let's say now that page B executes for a while. Eventually, we reach a point where process B needs to read something from page B0. That page is not currently present in memory. So we will first eject an existing page from memory. Let's say that we wanted to eject page A0. This actual decision would be made by a page replacement algorithm, which we will talk about later. If A0 needs to be written back, then because it is modified, we will actually change the contents on the disk to reflect, to reflect the changes to page A0. Then we will erase the page from memory indicate that it is no longer present in the page table before then transferring page B0 into memory and then also mark that page as present in the page table and indicate that it is at frame 10. Because only a portion of each running process needs to be in memory at any given time, Virtual memory systems like this one allow for many more processes to be resident in memory, thus allowing for greater processor utilization. Virtual memory systems also lead to increased complexity in many other ways, as will be shown subsequently. Let's first review basic address calculation in a paging system. When we have a logical address, in a process, which in a virtual memory system is also known as a virtual address, those addresses contain a page number and an offset. Now remember that we have to look up the frame number in the page table to figure out the actual physical address in memory. Also remember that the page table is itself stored in memory. The CPU has a special register that stores a pointer to the start of the page table. So this register contains a physical address that is the base of an actual page in memory, which itself contains the page table. In this example, we happen to be storing the page table at frame 7. So, if we take a virtual address and want to compute a physical address, the page number is essentially an offset in memory from the start of the page table. Let's say the page number we're looking up is 4 and the offset is 7. We would take this 4 add it to the pointer for the base of the page table. That means we're essentially moving four units down from that base to get an entry in the page table. I've drawn an entry here, and this entry contains an 11 in very small writing. In other words, we're going to go to frame 11 to find the address we want. Frame 11 is down here. Our offset is 7, so I will move 7 units from the beginning of that frame to reach the memory address 
the physical memory address that I'm looking for, designated by this line here. This approach works fine for simple paging, but if I want to have a process that can address more memory addresses than can be referred to within a single page, I have several options. I could either have a page table that fills up several pages of memory, but that is very wasteful because I will seldom need to know where all of the pages of my process are at a given time. An alternative is to have a multi-level page table like so. This is an example of a two-level page table and because there are two levels my virtual address contains a root page number and then a child page number and then an offset. If I had more than two levels I would have more offset page numbers in my address. But we'll just use two for this example. This page table pointer in the register is now simply the address to the root page table. The root page table must be resident in memory. That number here is still four. So I take four, I add it to the base address of the root page table to find a page table entry. In this example, that frame number is 9. So I go to frame 9. Now I look at the next number in my virtual address. This is the second page number and it is 2. So I will add 2 to the beginning of frame 9 to get the entry there which is 11. So what I have here in frame 9 is not a page of the process, but rather another page table, a sub-page table, if you will. And by accessing this entry, I have finally found frame 11, which contains the actual page of the process. And my offset within that page is 7, which gets me to the memory address that I'm actually looking for, either a line of code I want to execute or some data I want to retrieve. So this process involved going to a root page table, using it to look up another sub page table, and using that page table to look up an actual page of the process. The benefit of this approach is that all of the sub-page tables of the process do not need to be resident in memory at the same time. So I can address a very large memory space, but I do not have to have the entirety of my page table resident in memory at the same time. These pages that contain sub-page tables can be loaded in and out of memory, just like other pages in a virtual memory system. The downside to this system is that I've added an extra memory access, which means that every time I look up a physical memory address, I will take a little bit of extra time to have that extra memory read. There is yet another way of dealing with addressing large memory spaces, and that is an inverted page table. A problem with the page tables we have seen so far is that they must contain an entry for every single virtual address that the process has. In other words, the page table contains an entry for pages that are not even present in memory. An alternative approach that helps with addressing very large memory is an inverted page table. In this approach, the size of the page table is proportional to the size of memory because this type of page table contains one entry per available frame in memory 
as opposed to one per virtual address. This makes the table much smaller, but it makes the lookup procedure slightly more complicated. It essentially depends on the use of a hash table. The inverted hash table, which is shown here, zoomed in, but is actually also contained in memory like all page tables, will contain one entry per frame in memory. So the frames are simply listed sequentially. The virtual address in this sort of system will have a page number and an offset. We take the page number and send it to a hashing function. The hashing function will take that page number and somehow spit out a frame number. For this example, the hash function happens to map 5 to 11, which is the frame number. Now, it is possible that the hashing function will map multiple page numbers to the same frame value, so we have to be careful. We must check the inverted page table to make sure that both the page number and the process, here A, are correct. Anytime we are executing a process, we will know which process it is. If the process matches and the page number is what we're expecting, then we know that the frame number we have found is in fact the location of the page we're looking for. So we go to that frame number, in this case 11. We take the offset from the virtual address, take that 7, add it to the beginning of frame 11 to get the address we're looking for. Now in those cases where we have a clash with our hash function, we use a chain pointer in the inverted hash table. Let's see how that works with a different virtual memory address. Let's say I want an address from page 2 of process A. I take 2 and I feed it into my hash function, but it just so happens that an input of 2 leads to an output of 10. Looking at my inverted page table, I see that the page associated with frame 10 is page 0 of process B. Since this page and process do not match what I'm looking for, I go to the chain pointer. This will be a pointer containing a memory address in the inverted page table, depicted here with an arrow. I follow this arrow up to this entry here. Now I look at this entry and see if it matches the process and page I'm looking for, and sure enough it does. This is process A, and it is page 2. So the actual frame I'm looking for is frame 8. So I will go to frame 8 here, and sure enough, that is where page A2 is. Now I can use my offset from the virtual address to find the actual physical address that I want in memory. Note that if I ever reach the end of a chain, and still do not find the page and process I am looking for, it means that that particular page is not currently loaded into main memory and must therefore be retrieved from disk. This is yet another way that paging can be used in conjunction with virtual memory.